Welcome back to Market Insights Webinar. This is Kevin Prince from BMO Exchange Traded Funds. So glad to have you back and so glad to have so many of you join us today for this special edition of the Market Insights Webinar. Now, just like in other times, just want to quickly highlight from a disclaimer perspective, we're not going to provide specific advice here. We're not going to provide specific recommendations. And if you need that, please seek out professionals in that space. And ultimately, really what I want to give you today is some insights to the overall market itself. And today, we have some special guests. Oh, and I'll say the same thing for Bebo Investor Line, who's our guest today, too. Won't be advice, won't be recommendation, but just some general insights on the market. Thank you so much for joining us. So we have some special guests today for this, this special edition. First, first of all, I'm going to introduce Silvio Strokescu. Silvio, thank you. He is the president of BMO Investor Line to join us, as well as Mark Reyes, who's from BMO Global Asset Management, will join us and give some ETF context. Today's focus session is around direct investing, or I like to call it digital investing in the marketplace. So with that, let's get into it. I'm going to start off right with Silvio. Silvio, you know, looking at your website, I saw some pretty interesting tools, and I always like to start these sessions off with some review of tools. On your website, you've got a pretty good educational center, publicly available, no sign in. Can you walk us through what you can find inside that? Yeah, great. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, good afternoon to all our listeners as well. Uh, well, let me just say, Kev, first of all, this is uh, prime time for digital investing, as you put it, and um, our education center is seeing a lot of traffic, a lot more traffic than it's seen before. I think a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that you know time is a bit of a superpower for uh, all of us as consumers in this COVID world. And a lot of the investors are actually finding this is a great opportunity for them to build a level of knowledge, uh, feed their appetite and their curiosity to learn more about what's going on. So what we've done in the education center is actually expanded both the uh, content as well as increasing the frequency with which we update the content. So in here you'll find um, Content that ranges anywhere from macroeconomic trends right through to uh, insights on um, how to respond to pandemic, uh, how you know, how to respond to kids learning online, so lifestyle changes as well. And um, we find that um, this is a great opportunity for for people to just really ramp up uh, on their knowledge, but also uh, for us to connect with our clients. And the goal of this is really for us to uh, to empower people to uh, make smarter investment decisions. So it's great to see the, uh, the high demand and the increased traffic uh, to these pages. And as I said, we've also responded to make sure that uh, we're getting ahead of the curve and feeding our clients appetite for this knowledge. Thanks for that. And I think it's some really good articles. I'd encourage all the listeners today just to take a look at the BMO Investline public website and take a look at the Education Center. Lots of new art articles on a regular basis. With that, let's get into the core of the content, because again, we're gonna focus in on digital markets. Uh, Silvio, kind of give us the lay of the land, what you're seeing going on in the digital markets. You're seeing a few aspects as it starts to expand beyond the traditional form of digital. But walk us through that. Yeah, it's bang on, Kevin. Look, I mentioned uh, prime time. Uh, it is definitely prime time in, in digital investing. And uh, what we show here on the screen, um, it, it's really a bit of a state of the nation with respect to how Canadians are investing their assets uh, these days. So um, the spectrum that we've built is based on a degree of delegation. So how much of the investment decisions are being delegated from low to high on the X axis, and also the degree of human interaction on the Y axis from low to high. And what you'll see, the services that are human assisted on the right, uh, there are about $2 billion of assets that have been invested this way. So this is through human advisors with I would say limited to no digital um, uh, digital interaction. Uh, these are the services that have been around the longest, and obviously the bulk of the assets have been invested in this traditional fashion. And then as we navigate to the left, these are the categories that are actually growing the fastest. So you'll see on the far uh, left at the bottom, um, at the bottom left side, you see the uh, what we refer to as digital, but that's online brokerage. This is the trading platforms where there is no advice provided. Uh, rather just uh, fulfilling uh, trade requests from clients and uh, providing them access to education tools and insights um, as the ones we just noted earlier. The category that's grown the fastest is this hybrid advice category. 
And just to add a little bit of context around what these services consist of, uh, you are able to receive advice um, in a digital context. The advice is provided through digital tools that tell you how to build a portfolio, how to make sure that that portfolio is actually still aligned with your goals, and you're rebalancing the makeup of what's in the in your portfolio uh, to respond to market fluctuations. So we provide specific uh, advice on what to buy, what to sell, how much of it to buy, how much of it to sell. So very specific guidance and advice through digital tools. And then these tools are also complemented by a human, uh, by an advisor that you can speak to, to really add a degree of validation and just add a, a human sounding board, which our clients have told us is, is super important. So this is a category that is, um, you know, the, the newest category, but it's also the one that's uh, growing the fastest. And in particular for us, we have two services. Uh, one we refer to as Smartfolio, which most of our listeners may be familiar with this robo advice category. And then we also have a service which is uh, unique in Canada, and uh, we refer to it as Advice Direct. And this is where we provide investors the recommendations and specific direction on how to rebalance their portfolios. And, uh, and we do this with the aid of digital tools. Advice Direct is the one that we're seeing the fastest growth in. And uh, it's attracting clients that would have traditionally invested with an advisor in the past and now are uh, looking for ways to, to empower themselves to, to, uh, to do more on their own and invest digitally. So it's one, a great transition from a traditional advice model into uh, digital, but we're also seeing clients that would have invested um, in a self-directed manner through online brokerages adopt those digital advice uh, services um, for the benefit of just having that human connection, that human sounding board and, and the validation it provides. Thanks, Sylvia. So, you know, and what we're really seeing here, of course, is the evolution. And I think that's interesting because, you know, everybody on the line here, of course, is potentially foc is focusing around digital. And it's interesting to see the evolution of the market year over year over year. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the market more recently. There's certainly been a lot of news in around trading. Can you talk to us a bit about what you're seeing from your perspective in trading and going on the market from that perspective? Definitely high in activity. And, uh, you know, I'll probably use this term prime time again here. Um, this is why we're referring to uh, this particular period very prime time in, in digital investing. So in addition to the adoption of digital advice channels that we just touched on, we're seeing a higher degree of engagement and adoption in the uh, self-directed channel. So what you have on the screen here uh, is a trend that shows the number of uh, gross new accounts that were open in the self-directed space. And you'll notice uh, we just established a new record in the quarter that ended in March 2020. Um, there was a previous record uh, in March 2018, and uh, most of our listeners may be able to refer to this period as the time when a new sector was introduced, and that was specifically the cannabis sector, which drove um, a heightened demand for uh, for trading services. Um, a couple of things to, to note here, just add a bit of color. Uh, you'll notice from March 2018, when this uh, inflection point happened, it did actually spur additional um, acceleration in the adoption of, uh, of accounts in this uh, self-directed space beyond that as well. So it wasn't just uh, you know, an event that happened that particular quarter, but it actually acted as a bit of an inflection point and it spurred accelerated growth, accelerated digital adoption beyond that as well. Uh, what we've seen happening in, in um, this first quarter of this year uh, is A, we set a new record, but we're also seeing this uh, as not just an event that happened because of the market, fluctuation in March, but rather an inflection point, which will continue to lead to acceleration of uh, adoption of digital investing going forward. So we're in a period of time where anything uh, with uh, digital uh, from adoption perspective has a curve. And every time you have an event that gives that a curve an inflection point, the pace of growth continues to go up. To go up. And what we've seen, um, if we think back to longer waves on adoption of digital banking, for example, you know, the growth doesn't come down. The adoption for digital services doesn't decline once it's actually received the boost. So can we expect this type of acceleration in the adoption of digital investing, both in terms of the self-directed space as well as digital advice, to continue growing 
at a pace which will accelerate going forward. Let's, I mean, you've definitely seen a, a transformation in the marketplace, and I think it's beyond just opening accounts. Talk to us a bit about what you're seeing in now, the uh, the trading aspect too, for that matter, with your with the general industry right now. Record uh, record breaking demand, record breaking activity. The visual that we have on the screen right now depicts that as well. Again, you'll see. Uh, the previous record was actually established in, in the uh, time frame when the cannabis sector was introduced. So that's when we hit uh, the last record as far as uh, the number of uh, trades on the platforms. Um, we've almost doubled that previous record. And you'll notice uh, what we've seen in Q1 and Q2 of uh, this year is actually continued acceleration in, in the trading activity. So again, I would suggest this is A, uh, a driver as a result of digital adoption and the number of um, the increasing number of gross new accounts we saw on the previous screen, but we're also seeing existing clients, those that already had accounts on the self-directed platform, we're seeing them re-engaged and uh, and and uh, doing more trading than they had done before. And just to put this into context, typically when um, investors open a self-directed account, they come in with a lot of euphoria around being able to do this on their own excited to trade to build their portfolios and what we see over time the um, that euphoria tends tends to dry off a little bit uh, and typically almost uh, two-thirds of the investors would actually trade only about once or twice a year um, so we do have a lot of investors that have had trading accounts set up but they become disengaged primarily because a the level of knowledge required to trade on their own the emotional fortitude to make your trading decisions. And, and frankly, most importantly, is the amount of time required to ramp up on both uh, the knowledge and, uh, and the time you need to, to make those trades. And obviously time as a superpower since COVID has actually driven a lot of the existing clients back to uh, the trading platforms and has, uh, has also led to a higher degree of engagement. So two drivers here, Kevin, uh, adoption overall and continued growth as far as how many people are starting to invest digitally and those that had accounts already set up are coming back to the platforms and uh, and doing even more than they had done pre-covid i mean that, that's pretty good insight when you talk about what's the key drivers of the overall market itself and i think really thank you for sharing that with the broader audience we have here i know what you also did for us and i really appreciate this you took a little perspective beyond the industry and, and want to share that on specifically around what's going on inside investor line and related channels digital channels talk to us about what you're seeing specifically in your with inside your channels and activities there yeah so it's very similar trends to what uh, we reference at the industry level uh, we're definitely seeing a, a acceleration in the opening of new accounts we've indexed these numbers to um, the trends that we saw back in november and what you'll notice uh, compared to the account openings from november um, we're about 50 percent higher in august and typically June, July, August, from a seasonality perspective, tend to be slower months. So the fact that we had this um, inflection point happening in March and um, that trend continues um, is actually a really good sign that Canadians are making the most of their time to actually uh, ramp up on their knowledge and, uh, and adopt digital investing. In, um, in the middle section, we actually depicted the number of trades per clients. And again, it just adds more of the data and fact-based information to note that both existing clients and new clients are actually more active when it comes to their trading activity. To add a bit of color here, you'll see that inflection point in March. What we noticed in March, uh, right across our client base, people were making adjustments to their portfolios. So those that had been invested for a while, especially those that are actually in retirement, uh, they made some adjustments in their portfolios and reduced the uh, equity exposure. Um, in order to uh, for them to adjust to the heightened risk based on the volatility that we're seeing in the market at the time. So that led to higher activity, I would say event-based activity in March from uh, that segment of clients. And then of course, the ones that had just joined us had also been um, trading you know, beyond March and hence why you'll see continue with uh, momentum on the trading front. And um, the last, the last graph here just shows the cash balances uh, in the accounts. And one point I would note here, again, just color beyond what you see on the graph, um, this is not a flight to safety, right? So people are not selling out of equities and going into cash. What's driving the heightened cash balances 
um, are, are, are there, there are two drivers. So first one is actually existing clients depositing more money into their, uh, their self-directed accounts to trade more and also to take advantage of opportunities. We're seeing uh, new clients who are opening new accounts and bringing in net new deposits into the account. They're deploying about 50% of the cash that they're bringing in upfront. And the other 50% is waiting for opportunities along the way. So I think it's really important to note here on, on this um, bottom graph in particular that it's not a flight to safety as a, as a emerging theme, but rather more money being brought into the self-directed accounts to, uh, to take advantage of the volatility and what some of our clients see as an opportunity to invest for the longer term. You know, th thank you for your perspective there. I mean, really what you're seeing in my mind is you're seeing here through your numbers is the transformation going on with inside the industry and the overall adoption coming across for these digital channels and the choices across the digital channels across the board. So it really is interesting to see this and see this happening in these markets too, for that matter. Mark, let me bring you in for a sec. Um, what I'd like to talk about is, you know, because we, we do focus on ETFs on a regular basis. Oops, wrong direction. And Mark, give us some perspective here, what you're seeing in the ETF growth in the online or the digital channels relative to uh, full service brokerages in the past uh, at the same time. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everyone, once again, for uh, listening in this week. We appreciate you doing so. We appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, so, Kevin, I'll try to move through this a little bit quickly. Um, but what I find most interesting when you think about ETFs is that a direct investor, uh, so you or I or, or mom or dad or anyone like that, is accessing the same investment, uh, you know, that the largest institutions or the biggest advisor books are using. So when we talk about ETFs, we do talk about how they democratize investing. They, they create a level playing field uh, for all participants. So it's interesting here when you look at full service brokerage versus online brokerage, and you actually see a pretty consistent use of ETFs uh across them uh the absolute number may be playing more into the overall size but looking at us versus canada it's quite interesting to see an almost bang on percentage between the two uh between us and canada with full service and online so it's 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 another validation point that an end investor a direct investor with an etf is able to pursue the same strategies with the same vehicles uh, that someone with an advisor or even an institution can use. Thanks, Kev. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Good insights there. Let me, um, and then, then you know what? Maybe, Mark, stay there for a second and talk to us about, um, you know, why we're seeing ETFs in becoming that part of that portfolio construction out there for various uh, direct or digital investors. Sure, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit with, uh, with the balanced ETFs, um, but it, it's great to reemphasize it. And it was interesting to hear Silvio speak about uh, cash balances, people bringing money into the account and, and perhaps half investing it. Uh, you know, that becomes a challenge when, when cash is sitting on the sidelines and if markets continue to rise, as you know, they did throughout the summer here, uh, it becomes harder and harder to find that entry point uh, just when you have that remorse of potential gains that you left behind. So that's certainly uh, something that is front and center. Uh, you know, we're sometimes quick to make the, uh, the deposit, but less quick to, uh, to make the investment. So that's quite important. And ETFs, of course, help you uh, by staying invested, not worrying about market timing, getting a market exposure. Another one that comes up a lot, which is interesting to talk about, are overly concentrated portfolios. So we may have a few stocks that we like or a few tips that we've received or really focused perhaps on some growthier exposures. Uh, and of course, those names can deliver excellent returns for our portfolios. Uh, however, if you want to add some discipline, if you want to diversify your portfolio, want to lower your overall portfolio risk, 
again, bringing some ETFs in uh, can really help do so, whether that's a full market equity, fixed income, or now um, a balanced ETF. Uh, rebalancing is another one that comes up. So, you know, you might have a name that you've held for a couple of years, something like an Apple or an Amazon uh, that's done really well for you. Uh, it's become an outsized weight in your portfolio without you really doing anything. Uh, by holding some ETFs, uh, you get that rebalancing going on for you automatically to, again, deal with that potential concentration in your portfolio. And the last one, uh, less fun to talk about, um, but a bit of remorse. If, if you've got some stocks sitting in the bottom of your account, uh, you bought a few years ago, perhaps they didn't go the way you wanted them to, uh, hard to cut your losses, you're holding on. Uh, you know, but sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, a dog is a dog and uh, getting into an ETF that takes away uh, that security selection question uh, can be quite advantageous for a portfolio. So just thinking about some of the common mistakes that we run into time and time again in our own portfolios, thinking of different ways that ETFs can help you navigate around that. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Mark. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm certainly seeing, certainly seeing the cascading growth in ETFs across the board for a strong, uh, strong year in ETFs here in Canada. But Silvio, you take a look at you know, kind of a better pr perspective and specifically the digital marketplace beyond specifically ETFs. You're seeing a few things going on where um, different asset class, different asset types are certainly having different trends going on. Maybe share for us, you can, what is going on with the different assets within inside the direct channels and give us some perspective there. Indeed, Kevin, we're seeing some uh, some trends shaping up here as well. And maybe uh, before I get into those, just to, to read through the graph, uh, we've done here a relative comparison to trading volumes prior to COVID. So and it's, let's call this pre-March, which for many of us probably feels like it's a very long time ago. Um, and um, as you look through the equity trades, for example, on this March to May timeframe, equity trades increased by 90% in March to May uh, relative to pre-COVID levels. Um, and you'll see also uh, an increase in ETFs in that time frame, and an increase in that same time frame also for uh, fixed income products. And recall, I referenced the fact that a lot of our clients in March and April in particular were rebalancing their portfolios and those that were already retired um, reduced the equity exposure in their portfolios. What we've seen since uh, since then, so in this June to September, it's the time frame we highlighted next as a relative comparison, that trading continues at heightened levels for equities. Uh, for ETFs in particular, is actually flat, which speaks to uh, is still a relative strength compared to what we see the uh, fixed income trading and, and mutual funds as well. So it, it does speak to the fact that um, some rebalancing had taken place initially in this March to May timeframe. And since then, we're seeing sustained momentum in trading for equities and, um, and a decrease in trading for um, fixed income and mutual funds. That's, I mean, you're certainly, and I like the context of the, over the short period here of the last, since the correction and since, of course, the COVID kicked, kicked in and thinking about that. Uh, Mark, talk to us a bit about, you know, why we're seeing the different type of uses of ETS. I mean, Sylvia just mentioned here about rebalancing, maybe pause for a bit here, but talk to us about the other people, the other reasons people are utilizing ETFs to access the marketplace. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, when I think of it in the context of our own portfolios, uh, it really does have a lot of the same uses, again, that you, you see uh, in advisor-led portfolios. So portfolio completion is, is a big one. So we may pick a few names, let's say, in the Canadian market or even the U.S. market that we invest in, uh, but we're unsure of how to deal with fixed income or international equity markets. Uh, so some pretty big asset classes uh, that are that are important to everyone's portfolio uh, that can be easily invested in with single ticket, easy to use uh, ETF solutions. Uh, ETF overlay. Uh, this is an idea. Uh, you know, if you if you want a sleeve in your portfolio, 
uh, that's invested in markets but is highly liquid. You know, maybe you like to play in some smaller cap names or some venture type names. Uh, holding an ETF gives you that liquidity that you might need uh, from time to time so that you don't have to sell things that are that are less liquid. Core satellite is always interesting. Uh, you can pair, you know, active approaches, whether that's a fund or yourself picking stocks uh, with passive, and then you get the best of both worlds. You get market exposure and, and blend your costs down. Or uh, even by regions. So you might think, okay, here in Canada, I, I know some names, I can pick some names, but as I go elsewhere, uh, I'm less confident in doing so. So therefore an ETF makes sense. And, you know, just portfolio building on its own. So with balanced ETFs now out there with, with core equity and bond exposures out there, I don't want you to just think that, that ETFs are being used around the fringes of your portfolio. Uh, they really can be used as effective solutions to build an overall or complete portfolio. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that, Mark. Hey, Silvio, one thing that I, you know, come to appreciate, done a lot of presentations in the past with Investor Line. So we've seen a large demographic, different demographic that utilize the platform. Give us some insights you can on the demographics and the trading over the over the last little while, if you can. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks, guys. We're seeing, um, let me just actually give you a bit of context first on who trades on digital platforms and what that mix looked like uh, pre-COVID. Uh, about two-thirds of the clients that uh, trade on digital platforms were older than 55, so over-indexed towards uh, the older generations. What we've seen since, uh, since March is actually a bit of a flip where the new clients that have joined us since March, two thirds of them are actually under 35. So we're seeing a higher degree of uh, adoption as well as activity from, uh, from younger generations, from younger clients. And uh, what you'll see on the screen is also the, the, the trend as far as heightened engagement and heightened activity from this group uh, continues to, uh, to, uh, to, to dominate. Uh, so we thought that's a, it's an interesting insight just to see how the overall investor base is uh, balancing off uh, from a generational perspective. And the, the, I mean, I think that's very interesting to see the demographics and see what's the trends going on with insight in the more recent periods. You know, the big question I probably have for you, Silvio, is there's all this background you've given us and certainly your insights to the marketplace. Thank you for sharing that. Like, where does it go from here? Give us that insight what you're seeing, where do you think it goes next? We're certainly seeing where it's transitioned, but where does it go from here? Look, it's, um, it, it, the, the big question here is, uh, you know, are we seeing an event, right, where, you know, people are coming on board right now because of, um, you know, what's happening with COVID or, or many of us spending more time indoors, having more time to reflect, more time to, to uh, educate ourselves and build our knowledge. Um, or is this a true inflection point that's going to lead to continued accelerated adoption of digital investing going forward? Uh, we believe in, uh, in the latter, for sure. We believe this is not just an event. We believe it's actually an inflection point that leads to, uh, to accelerated adoption going forward. And typically, you know, most of our audience will be familiar with the fact that we say it takes about 30 days to build new habits. Well, look, we've all lived our lives in this new reality. Uh, for more than 30 days and frankly we'll continue to be living like this for definitely more than 30 days going forward so this is um, if you think about the role of digital and how that's transformed our lives and how we act as consumers i anticipate the long wave of that will continue on a go forward basis and that will be a key driver of uh, even more accelerated digital adoption going forward so that's the first macro uh, macro trend I'll highlight. Again. The second is this growth of digital advice services. Um, we're seeing clients um, that are looking for more validation, especially with heightened market volatility. And the fact that we have services that are available on digital channels. Points that allow you to rebalance on a, on a rational level 
that empower you, frankly, with the emotional fortitude to make those decisions and, and to sell out the things that um, are not performing well uh, that may have heightened risk. So the digital advice tools actually are a great enabler of uh, smarter investment decisions. And I believe that trend will continue on a go forward basis. If we were to peek through the curtain, you know, five years from now, I would anticipate um, the digital advice, that hybrid category that we saw in the middle earlier, will not only be the fastest growing still at that time, but it will compete with the likes of uh, investable assets invested in uh, what today we refer to as traditional advisor services. Thanks, Sylvia. That's, uh, I mean, really good understanding of where it's going to and a good background of where we are right now. And again, I, I still see the transformation continue going forward. And it's amazing to see that happen right now in these, real, in these times. Now, we're going to shift gears here because we've had a number of key questions coming in and spend some time answering those. One thing I'll do is, is before we go to those, a quick little shout out. We do run Market Insights webinars on a regular basis, so we've had some special guests join us today. If you're looking for some regular insights in the marketplace, specifically, you know, some of our guests being index providers or exchanges, not advice, not recommendations, but just general market insights, we're happy to have you join us each Friday from 1 to 1.30. With that, let's get into a couple of questions. First, let's go to Silvio. There is a lot of advancement out in technology, AI being incorporated in platforms. Where do you see the direct channel going forward? You talked about hybrid already, but is that gonna be the proper way to go? And generally, of course, is there a, how's it gonna affect the overall fees too for the industry? So it's a couple of questions. Maybe give a couple of thoughts here. Yeah, look, I love this and uh, and thank you for for engaging and, uh, and uh, putting forth the, the questions. Uh, look, we're in the midst of a transformation, a long wave transformation that's been enabled by technology. I think we've been living through it for a couple of decades now. And what we've seen uh, through COVID is really just a, an acceleration within that, uh, that longer wave. So there's no doubt about the fact that technology will play uh, a role, will continue to play a role in terms of how we engage as consumers in our lives overall. Um, that will apply to um, to digital investing uh, on a couple of fronts. So let me touch on uh, the fee aspect first. Um, there there is an opportunity to digitize and simplify processes, um, how trades are placed, not just from a user experience perspective, what investors see, but actually what happens from a processing perspective um, in the back offices. So digitization of processes and uh, using technology to make those uh, simpler, uh, smarter, and faster uh, in time will lead to uh, to lower operating costs and in time will actually lead to uh, lower fees as well. The, um, the, the most interesting aspect of how technology would enable digital investing going forward will definitely be in that hybrid advice bucket. And we think about this as um, creating new value networks through the aid of technology. So I already mentioned some of the services we offer today with respect to specific advice on how to build a portfolio, how to rebalance it. Those are new value networks that were not available in traditional online brokerages before, where you could read and you could educate and use tools and research and insights independently, but they were not giving you specific advice for your portfolio. That's where I see the evolution going and that's where I see the the enablement from a technology perspective, allowing us uh, as, as those of us in the industry to actually create new value networks that uh, will help our, our investors uh, make even smarter decisions going forward. Um, that's, uh, that's the area, Kev, that uh, we are spending a lot of our time on, thinking about um, how to build stability to, uh, through simplifying processes, and just as importantly, how, to, uh, how do we empower our clients to, uh, to make even smarter decisions. Thank you for that and uh, appreciate that you're looking not just now, but towards the future and where it's going. Mark, another question came in you really towards last week. So bring into this one. Uh, last week we did talk about the election aspect. Maybe not giving specific advice on what type of ETFs, but maybe generally people are thinking that Biden might get elected. So what's the general areas that people should be uh, thinking about as considerations in this space? Sure, thanks Kevin and thanks for the question. Uh, I do think that it, if 
Biden gets in, which is looking likely, but we all recall that uh, Trump had a miracle rally uh, back in 2016. Uh, but if he does get in, Biden, uh, there's a few things that we want to think about, uh, particularly if it becomes an overall Democratic sweep, so not just the uh, not just the presidential race. Uh, there's the possibility of higher corporate taxes that's been talked about. Uh, that would impact earnings and, of course, stocks. The the reality of that is maybe a little bit different from the promise, if because he wants to, of course, get the economy back on its feet again. Uh, theoretically, trade tensions would would start to drop off. Hopefully, uh, that might boost international emerging market equities. Um, hearing a lot of talk about infrastructure spending. Um, but also potential regulation on sectors like energy, healthcare, technology. Um, and overall, probably less resistance uh, in rolling out fiscal support. So, you know, if, if we pull those ideas together without getting into individual products, uh, international equities, uh, green energy, infrastructure, uh, potentially a weight uh, in fixed income, and I would also add uh, quality exposures to that, like our ZUQ or ZGQ, uh, that can help you weather through um, any any volatility in the marketplace with true market leading companies. So, Kevin, I'll leave it at that without getting into too many tickers. Thanks. Thank you for that, Mark. And we only have time to ask one more question. And I really appreciate everybody taking the time to send in questions. Silvio, there's somebody out here really excited to have you on, so I had to share this one, of course. Um, this individual is actually with a financial advisor and actually reading through the question, looking at doing a switch. We want to understand what the process is involved. And then, of course, you know, what kind of support is for this person who needs to be with an advisor looking at uh, direct investing or digital investing? Well, look, first, you know, thanks for the engagement and thanks for the question. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, engaging these conversations and uh, it's great to see the engagement from our clients as well. So, um, great to see that folks are finding value in the insights that we're sharing. Uh, let me just start off by saying this is typically the, the first question that we receive from a client that we see uh, in an, you know, ended up in an advice direct service. And the reason I say that um, in the past, if you were to transition from a traditional advisor service uh, to a digital alternative, the only alternative that existed was the self-directed platform, uh, which obviously required you to make your own decisions, and there was no advice um, available to you uh, as an investor in that platform. The digital advice services, which we reference as the fastest growing uh, category, are growing because clients are actually looking for digital alternatives, but they're still looking for advice. And uh, the uh, the availability of advice, both uh, on, in the context of digital tools, and more importantly, is is noted in this uh, in this question, is that human advisor to provide validation, to provide uh, support when uh, market volatility is at a peak, and the anxiety levels from an investor perspective are also at a relative peak. Um, those are the services that um, that land really well with uh, the type of uh, investors who are looking for advice. Um, to help you navigate through that, look, there's a digital seamless process that we've built online, which can start off with a tool where you tell us you know, who you are as an investor and how you like to engage with your investments. And through that tool, we uh, have a recommendation for the service that you should be considering. And then there's obviously a subsequent application process within that service. There's also human available. We have a team uh, that is uh, able to have the conversation with you to talk to you about the services to ask and get to know you and understand the type of investor you are and how you're looking to engage with your investments on a go forward basis and determine which service is best suited to empower you to make those decisions. So we have the humans that are available uh, at the very beginning as well just to really have that introductory conversation with you uh, and determine which service suits best. And Kev, I'll, I'll wrap this up by saying, um, and maybe you know, sharing a little bit of an insight as well, uh, digital advice services are actually attracting those that are starting out to invest. So you know, the younger generations who, uh, who are starting out with small balances, but we're actually also attracting those that have invested for a long time. They've built uh, you know, a sizable nest
Sylvia, so, yeah, I think I just lost you there. Dollars. So it speaks to the fact that um, we have a lot of the um, investors that have been doing this for a long time that are seeing tremendous value in having digital tools and that human complement is an alternative to the way they traditionally invested. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it there, Kev. And, um, and I really appreciate the engagement. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I lost, you, I lost you for a bit in that question, but I got the overall understanding. And you know what? As a client, myself personally, Investor Line, I really appreciate that you took the time and effort to join us today. And I'll also say to Mark, thank you for taking the time and joining us today as we wrap up. You know, this has been a special edition of our Market Insights webinar, really providing people insights around the digital channel and the movement towards the digital channel. We've certainly seen a lot of aspects of that, and I really appreciate that you took the time to share those insights today. I will highlight that next week, we will have MSCI join us next week to talk about emerging markets. Friday at one o'clock, if you can join us. Thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for sending questions in. Have yourself a good weekend. Cheers.